Good morning. I'm here at the Buffalo River Works on a slightly windy day to talk about the second chapter of the Book of Ruth. This setting is such an amazing place and reflects the, the power of the history of our city. At one time in the late 1800s and, and early 20th century, Buffalo was home to 30 grain elevators. These massive, massive uh, buildings that were, that were made mostly of cement, and they housed grain that came from the Midwest and in Buffalo was transferred over to canal boats or eventually trains to travel down to the New York City area, the East Coast, and oftentimes on to Europe and other parts of the world. Grain of all kinds is so essential to human life. It provides nutrition and in the story of Ruth, grain plays an essential symbolic and practical role. In today's second chapter of Ruth, we encounter Ruth and Naomi once again. They have been living in Bethlehem for several months now, still relatively powerless and helpless as two single widowed women in this city. Naomi has extended family nearby, which is why they chose Bethlehem. And of course, Ruth is a foreigner, a Moabite, who has pledged her life, her very existence, to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, she says. But these women are hungry. If there isn't a man to look out for them in that ancient culture, they're very likely to die or to have to make other very humiliating and difficult choices for themselves. And so on this day, Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going to go and glean in the fields. We are hungry. We need something to eat. And off she goes to the first field that she finds where workers are, are harvesting the grain. And she does this strange activity that we are unfamiliar with called gleaning. Gleaning simply means going around the perimeter of a planted field while it's being harvested or after the harvest is finished and picking up the plants that are left behind. Still usable, but not considered quite good enough for sale at the marketplace. Now why would she do this? Because she had no other choice. But there's more. In the book of Leviticus, that, that huge book of laws that God gave his people so that they could learn to live with God first in their lives and caring for each other because God knows that that is when life is best. In that book, God gives specific instruction to everyone who owns or harvests a field. God says, whenever you are harvesting, leave a portion of your field around the perimeter. Don't take that grain. Or better yet, leave parts of the grain standing so that those who have no field to harvest, those who have no livelihood, those who are hungry, those who are left behind, can go and gather up a portion of your harvest and live. Now, when we think of Ruth going out into this field of someone she didn't know and taking a portion of crops she did not plant or harvest, we might say, well, those people back then were very charitable. And we might think of those times in our own lives when, when we have given something that we had that was extra to those who don't have enough. But if we really understand God's special love and care 
for the marginalized, the widows, the orphans, the powerless, those who are always left behind, those who never have enough to have an abundant life, then we can see that this law that God gives his people is not about charity at all. It's about justice. But it's a very different kind of justice than the kind of justice you and I think about, isn't it? When we think about justice, we usually think about the criminal justice system that is based on a core belief that if you do what is right and good, you will be rewarded. But if you mess up, if you break the law, there will be consequences. And our court system, in many cases, is designed to ensure that people who break the law, who hurt other people, who damage other people, do in fact receive consequences. That's not justice in God's kingdom. The way God sees justice is that everything that is wrong in this world is made right. We might think of it as a way of, of God turning the world upside down like Jesus did, helping us to recenter our thoughts, to, to change our understanding of how life is supposed to be in this world that God created so that we, you and I and all people could have a good and abundant life. And so we can understand why Ruth went into that field that day, took some of the harvest and took it home to Naomi so that the two of them who were so hungry could finally be filled. Along the way, as Ruth is gleaning in that field, and remember, she is a foreign single woman. She is incredibly vulnerable in that environment where she is different from everyone else where she is a woman alone among working men harvesting that field. She was taking a huge risk to her own well-being. But in the course of this gleaning, Ruth meets a man named Boaz, the owner of this field and many others. Boaz is a, a prominent member of Bethlehem, of their culture, their society, their power structure. He is wealthy. He can have whatever he wants. And as Boaz comes and watches all the day workers harvesting his many, many fields, he spots this one woman, this foreigner named Ruth, and he asks the overseer, who is that woman gleaning in my field? The overseer says, well, she's a foreign woman who came along and asked if she could have some of the leftovers. And in that moment, Boast is filled with the chesed, the loving kindness of God. He sees this woman alone. He recognizes her. Oh, he's heard about her. And he goes to her and he says, I want you to be safe. You are welcome to whatever you want to take, but I want you to be safe in my field. So follow the young women, and I will tell all the men, all those workers, to leave you alone. And not only does Boaz do that, but when break time comes and all the workers are seated on the ground eating their lunch and Boaz and his family are there eating their lavish lunch, he sees Ruth sitting all by herself, like one of those kids in school who nobody liked because he was different sitting alone in the cafeteria. And he calls her over and he fills her bowl to overflowing with food and invites her to eat with him and his family. As the chapter that we heard today ends, Ruth takes the bounty, the, the bushel basket of grain that she has gathered that day home to Naomi. And Naomi is overwhelmed. And she says to her, whose field did you glean in today? And, when Ruth tells her it was Boaz, Naomi's mind starts working. Oh, she says, he's one of our family members, part of our extended family. And suddenly Naomi conceives of an idea that maybe there can be a connection here, a deep and life-giving and meaningful connection. 
between Ray Naomi, excuse me, between Ruth and Boaz. And we'll see that little bit of matchmaking play out in chapter three. But I think that this story leaves us with two important questions for us to ask ourselves. And the first one is, have we been open to all of those opportunities that God places in our path? Opportunities for us to be vehicles of God's hesed, God's loving kindness. It's been said that a miracle is God's activity among us when God chooses to be anonymous. And so we can wonder about that day so long ago when Ruth just happened to be in Boaz's field. He just happened to come along and see her. And we kind of get the idea that maybe there's a little chemistry there. Are you open to those opportunities in your life? Is your heart open to being an agent of God's loving kindness in this world that so often seems devoid of any kind of love or kindness? When's the last time you opened your eyes and your ears and your heart and let God lead you to that person who needs something that you have or part of who you are? question that this story raises in us is a question about abundance and stewardship. Oftentimes when we, when we think about the blessings that we have from God and we are moved to share those blessings, oftentimes we're sharing off from what is left in the back of our pantry. You know those canned goods that expired six months ago? For too many of us too often, that is what we bring to church and put in the food pantry box. Why should the lost and the least and the left behind have only what we think isn't good enough for ourselves? I wonder how we might be moved to remember that God has always asked his people to give back to God a tithe, a portion of what they have, what he has given them, but it's always the best of what they have, the first best grain, the best animal in the flock, because isn't that really exactly what should we, we should be giving back to the one who has given us so much? So I think that this story invites us to think about how we look at generosity, how we look at our blessings, and how we might turn our hearts a bit and start giving from the very best that we have instead of from what's left behind. This book of Ruth is an intriguing story that, that in so many ways shows that each of us can be and are a vehicle of God's loving kindness in the world. Ruth certainly was for Naomi. Boaz was for Ruth and Naomi. And next week we will see how the plot thickens and romance blooms and how God's power and presence has much to say to us.